here we are, the day of the premiere. And this is, you know, eight hours ahead of time. And a lot of those people have been camping there overnight. It's pretty humbling, really, to think that, you know, on one level, I just think we're making a movie, we're making a piece of entertainment. But on the other hand, there is this show of support for what we're doing. And uh, we're very, very grateful for that. Ten years later. <laughs> NerdErotic.com. Things must be really bad at Amazon right now because it looks like fan attacks are back on the menu, boys. Bottom line, once again, Amazon has hit panic mode and decided to create an ill-advised, yet they went ahead with it anyway, access media article that calls the fans who criticize this show patently evil we don't want to bury the lead here although it's not in this headline don't worry others will run with it the rings of power showrunners break silence on backlash sauron who's halbrand by the way and season two two first-time showrunners which shows who landed tv's biggest series give thr a behind the scenes tour as they navigate challenges even scarier than mordor from patently evil online trolling to massive industry expectations and i love the smell of cope in the late evening it smells like victory and that's exactly what this is again don't get down when you see headlines like this that were derived from this article rings of power showrunners discuss patently evil backlash to show i don't see how people who are saying these things think they are fighting for good it's patently evil says one of the showrunners who is currently vandalizing what a lot of nerds think is sacred text while continuing to lie to all of us while working for a giant trillion dollar company. Before we even get into this article, I will tell you, J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay, if we felt for one second that you approached this with any kind of respect towards Tolkien and his lore, we'd be fine with it. We'd be your biggest fans. But now that we've actually seen your show, after we've heard all of your words, and hate to use a phrase from another fantasy series, words are our wind. We know you're full of shit. It seems to me that he uh, he poured everything he knew about early literature into the fiction and that uh, one of the great strengths of the fiction has been this sense of an enormous weight of knowledge and accumulated experience and accumulated thought which has been put into it and which cannot be counterfeited which cannot be faked. So let's get into this article that's largely damage control. Unfortunately, the truth just keeps getting in the way. Give your full tongue behind your teeth. We're going to edit out the fluff of this article, and I'll just give you the meat and give it to you raw. The Rings of Power Season 2 showrunners McKay and J.D. Payne give a walkthrough of the sequences. They plan to introduce more iconic locations, familiar Middle-Earth characters. Why? Don't you want to introduce more original characters? A massive two-episode battle. This is obviously top-secret stuff. No media has been allowed on the fantasy drama set, let alone in this room. By the way, they call that room the War Room because they declared war on Tolkien, but the showrunners wanted to give the world a peek behind the curtain to reveal what it's like to manage the biggest flop of all time. I'm sorry, the biggest TV series ever produced? Since Amazon's billion-dollar disaster launched, on September 2nd, the anniversary of Professor Tolkien's death, the Rings of Power has been blessed with strong shill acclaim, 84% positive on Rotten Tomatoes. The majority of that 84% coming from shills who only watched the first two episodes. And dragged by online fan bashing, its audience score is at 39%. Correction, it's actually at 38%, and I'm guessing most of that audience has seen most of this series, unlike the shills. 38%, which includes an unknown degree of review bombing at the hands of internet trolls i'll ask the potential over 550,000 of you who have subscribed to this channel thank you very much a simple question who benefits from review bombing is it a fan who's just loved lord of the rings his entire life or her entire life and they're going to spend a bunch of time review bombing a show or is it a giant corporation that paid 250 million dollars for the rights who has i don't know the resources to buy things like fake reviews critics with their fake reviews and large access media outlets to run defense for them. But given the Lord of the Rings, the bar is insanely high, one that they set by calling this their billion dollar series and letting that run for years. But there's some revisionist history on that that we'll get to. And nobody knows the stakes better than Payne and McKay, who I'm guessing were given one more chance to get it right before their metaphorical heads will roll. Their first two-time showrunners, again, which shows who embarked on 
on an unexpected journey nearly five years ago to make their J.R.R. Tolkien passion project and have now found themselves, as McKay puts it, on the fault line of the culture war, a place you put yourself with everybody from armies of anonymous Tolkien fans, well, not everybody, to the two richest men in the world weighing in. It ain't easy to focus on writing scripts and managing a cast and crew of 1,300 on the most complicated TV production of all time when Elon Musk is slagging you on Twitter. Oh, I'm sorry. Is making pretend with unlimited resources hard for you? By the way, I have no doubt that Amazon instigated this article because in this next paragraph, they take a shot at HBO, the Peter Jackson trilogies, and attempt some revisionist history. Sources say HBO pitched the Tolkien estate on retelling Middle Earth's third age essentially remaking peter jackson's beloved lord of the rings trilogy remember that word beloved because it's followed with this which grossed a lot of money and a lot of oscars the estate had its gripes with jackson's adaptations the late christopher tolkien the author's son said they eviscerated the books and i have no doubt that he said that and i have no doubt that tolkien would have said that but i loved him but wasn't interested in treading the same ground so they decided to go with amazon who was going to retell the the events of the third age in the second age we get some lip service about the tolkien estate wanting to guard his legacy then we get to the most important thing the money and the revisionist history sources say the staggering number that's been widely reported 250 million was actually netflix's bid kind of funny that amazon's just let that float out there until today and that amazon's number was tens of millions less albeit still staggering netflix pitched doing several shows such as a gandalf series and an aragorn drama they took the marvel approach said one insider to the talks and that completely freaked out the estate okay good but that still doesn't make any sense because the estate turned down hbo's remake of the lord of the rings again good but then you went ahead and remade the lord of the rings in the second age with girl bosses going full the force awakens then they give us this big history which we've already gone over a hundred times on how this disaster was made and how big of fans patrick mckay and jd Payne were of the lord of the rings just like they said they were of star trek i've been a star trek fan since i was i don't know 15 years old and am totally versed in uh the next gen you know uh history and uh Embarrassingly, know like a lot of the episode names by by title, and we'll reference them as such when when talking about development stuff, you know. Right. Um, well, you know, in Best of Both Worlds Part Two, we actually had that, you know, the, 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 with the Borg when they're just you know it gets really. Hearing my, my co-writer and I brainstorm is like the, watching two Mad Men. And how did that turn out? But there are a couple of insights in this article that absolutely confirm the concerns the fans had before they saw a frame of footage. Co-showrunner McKay has an extraordinary level of energy and passion, and when he's in full pitch mode, he's as persuasive as a Middle-Earth-obsessed Saul Goodman. You find yourself nodding in agreement, suddenly wanting to buy property in Mirkwood. In other words, he's a bullshit artist trained by one of the best in Hollywood. At one point, Payne and McKay ask mentor and former boss Jar Jar Abrams to call Amazon to put in a good word, and he did. We feel like that moved the needle, said McKay. And the first season of Rings was an incredibly long shoot, complicated by COVID delays, extending over 18 months. The filming was done in New Zealand with bad reboot veteran Lindsay Weber brought on as a key executive producer. So the guys and gals that repurposed and destroyed Star Trek, repurposed and destroyed Star Wars, are now coming on to repurpose and destroy Lord of the Rings. How is anybody surprised? Some people had nice things to say about the pilot and the second episode, or they didn't have nice things to say, but I hope they stay for more episodes, McKay says. Unfortunately, they didn't. The bar has to keep going up. It's never left the ground. Criticism, they can handle. No, you can't. And they've heard it all. No, you haven't. Everything fans have debated, they say they likewise argued amongst the creative team. This is just a lie. You're not following the progression of the second age. You've made up half the characters. You're not focusing on the characters that you should, like Gilgalad, Asildur, and Elendil, and of course, Galadriel, not Galadriel. Where's Círdan? Where in the hell is Celeborn? What is your reasoning for keeping Galadriel's husband and daughter out of the first season? Because you wanted this meticulously constructed fantasy by a genius to reflect 
the world we actually live in. And you wouldn't want to rob Guy Ladriel of her agency and be weighed down by a husband and a daughter. We all know female empowerment is acting like a man. Again, knowing this article was instigated by Amazon, the showrunners were forced to admit a little failure. They readily admit, for instance, that some of the first season episodes lack the urgency fans expect from Tolkien adaptations. They don't have any urgency, but... Amazon isn't lacking for urgency because they've rushed into filming season two. It just started filming on the 3rd of October. The good news is we're still not going to see it for two years. Still, McKay notes they expect to work on season two for another couple of years. Thank God for small favors. The showrunners talked about wanting their series to be remembered in 60 years. It's not going to be remembered in 60 days. This thing is doomed. <laughs> As one Amazon insider puts it, according to The Hollywood Reporter, the Rings of Power quote, it's too big to lose, unquote. Unfortunately, it already has, thanks to people like J.D. Payne, Patrick McKay, Lindsay Weber, and Jennifer Salky, who runs Amazon Studios and whose neck is on the line. Yet Amazon has long known they were in for a rather bumpy series takeoff, and this has been the worst of all time. They saw Tolkien fans slamming the Rings of Power online before a frame had been released, and this is her quote, we all saw it coming. Guess what, Jennifer? So did we. There were no surprises. Again, totally agreed, Jennifer. Having insight into our global audience, we also have insight into darker sides of how people can manipulate reviews and have other points of view that we wouldn't support. In other words, we knew we had a giant global disaster on our hands. Notice how she conflated manipulating reviews with having views we wouldn't support. Views like respecting the lore. So the streamer announced it was switching off reviews for the show on its platform for its first 72 hours after its premiere and then kept them off for an additional five days. The company continued to monitor reviews. Some vanished so fast, it was like they were wearing the one ring. In other words, these were legitimate reviews from their customers that they had to get rid of because this is too big to lose. Amazon claims there has been a coordinated effort to attack the show for daring to diversify Tolkien with strong female characters and people of color. It's an explanation that satisfies the media but inflames some fans who feel the company is dismissive of any criticism and arguably risk escalating what might have been a short-term dust-up into an ongoing fandom trench war. If you don't like this TV show, you're racist. If you don't like this movie, you're an istophobe. And everybody is tired of hearing it. Many point out HBO's House of the Dragon faced similar trolling for its diversity moves, yet its audience scores weren't impacted at all because the show's good. And isn't that interesting that we have two fantasy series running at the same time and they're supposed to be doing as well as each other, but one is much more well-received and one is getting trashed because it's a bad show. And right on cue, it's your fault. But this article gets worse. But it's also possible Ring's percentage of agenda-based reviews might be much higher than for Dragon. Tolkien's world has a long, unfortunate history of attracting fascist-adjacent admirers, something that surely would have repulsed the fantasy world's anti-totalitarian author. So the Hollywood Reporter just defended Tolkien by saying that his beloved text attracts racists. Well, I couldn't agree more. He would be completely repulsed by anybody totalitarian, including his beloved text being subverted by a giant totalitarian trillion dollar company, calling his readers racist. And then we get to J.D. Payne's quote, which is in the byline, but buried in this tome of an article. I don't see how people who are saying these things think they're fighting for good. It's patently evil your criticism of the show the fact that you are pointing out that they are lying to the fandom and have been lying to the fandom is patently evil because i wasn't supposed to get caught after the worst episode of season one amazon suddenly announced that they're ramping season two production up and their big strategy to get people excited for it is again amazon saying they revere tolkien out of one side of their mouth and out of the other saying his work attracts fascists and once again calling Professor Tolkien's readers and Amazon's 
potential or current paying customers racist and adding that they're patently evil. Sounds like the same strategy as season one to me. But let's end on some good news. Nielsen ratings released on September 29th paint a highly successful launch roughly compatible with Dragon, House of the Dragon. Precise comparisons are nearly impossible because of several factors we won't bore you with, including Amazon not sharing any of their numbers. One industry insider familiar with Amazon's inner working suggests the other fantasy show, House of the Dragon's performance, is more anxiously followed than the company lets on. I love some unintentional truths. It was never about the critics. It's all about the consumers. I hate that word. The insider says all Jeff cares about is consumer obsession, not the paying customer. If you look at the history of Amazon, every division lived and died based on that. Dragon matters because all of a sudden there is a benchmark. It is their closest comp to success when they saw Dragon grew in its second episode and brought in 20 million viewers. They were shitting their pants. Of course they're shitting their pants. And again, the cope in this article was unreal. It was pure damage control. I've never seen anything like it. And it's because the Tolkien fan and the paying customer were right. We were right yesterday. We were right today. And we're going to be right tomorrow. If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, I thank you for listening this long. I'll see you in the next video. Nerdorotic.com Cast it into the fire! Destroy it!